Ladies and gentlemen, please help me give a big welcome to Marcel Salate. I would like to make the somewhat philosophical and also political argument for open data. And so, uh, since I'm by training a biologist, um, I can't possibly do this running around. Okay, so here we go. So, first the title. <clears throat> data of the people, by the people, for the people. So, about 150 years ago, the American president, Abraham Lincoln, gave a very short speech, only a few minutes long, on, on a battlefield in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. The occasion was to honor the soldiers who died in a fierce battle at the height of the American Civil War. And despite the brevity of the speech and the fact that almost no one actually understood Lincoln, uh, it is now perhaps the most famous speech in US history by a US president. It's only 10 sentences long, but to condense it even further here, Lincoln essentially said that there is nothing anyone could do to properly honor the fallen soldiers, other than to help ensure that the idea of this newly conceived nation would continue to live on. And that quote, government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not vanish from the earth, end quote. And, and by earth, he probably meant the United States at that point. So why is this such a powerful line? Well, it's, I think it's powerful because it expresses in very simple terms the basic idea of democracy. Uh, that we the people can form government, we the people make the political decision, and that in itself is in fact the best guarantee that the decisions are made in the best interest of us, the people. So, what does all of this have to do with open data? Fundamentally, government is about organizing power. And the vast majority of us agree that the power should be distributed among the many and not the few. And to quote John Dalberg Acton, liberty consists in the division of power, absolutism in the concentration of power. And that is what democracy is about. And that is the discussion I think we should have also about data because data equals power. And if liberty consists in the division of power or in the divided access to power, then that means that liberty also consists in the division of data or divided access to data. But what does it even mean to say that data equals power? So data contains information, information can be used for commercial gains, that we all understand. But the power of data is much more fundamental than that. And to understand this, we need to take a step back and reflect on where we are as humans at this point in time. We have now entered the so-called second machine age, an age where machines are not only much stronger, physically stronger than us, as they have been for, for many, many years, in fact, centuries, but also much, much smarter than we are. Not just a little smarter, but orders of magnitudes smarter. Most of us have come to determine the fact that machines will achieve human intelligence some point in the near future. But think about machines that are 10 times smarter, or maybe 100 times smarter. In fact, how do you feel about a machine that is a million times smarter than a human? And if you look at the progress, I mean, it's basically only a question of time. And, and thus, is, it's a question worth asking because we may not necessarily live to see such a machine, but our children or grandchildren probably will. So in any case, even a machine that's, let's say, 100 times smarter uh, than us is something you wouldn't want to compete against. You wouldn't feel comfortable if such machines were controlled by a small elite group. However, if such a machine were an agent at your service, and if everyone would have such agents, which they used to make their lives better, that would be an entirely different story. And so when AI, so artificial intelligence, becomes very powerful, it would be a disaster if that power were in the hands of a few, because we would then essentially go back to absolutism and despotism. And we therefore need to ensure that the power of AI is distributed widely. 
Now, where does AI come from? So, and how can we ensure this? There are some efforts, like the non-profit organization OpenAI that was recently created uh, by people uh, such as Elon Musk and others, that aim to ensure that this is the case. In fact, if you follow the field of machine learning a little bit, the field that is currently at the heart of most of the, the breakthroughs uh, in AI, or AI-relevant breakthroughs, then you would see that most organizations are now open sourcing the code that's behind these AI breakthroughs. And that's a good thing because it helps ensuring that the raw machinery to build AI, the algorithms, are indeed in the hands of many. But this is not enough, not nearly. It's very important to recognize that the power of AI is not simply in the algorithms. It's not simply in the technology per se. It's in the data. AI becomes intelligent when it can quickly learn on large amounts of data. I mean, basically, AI without learning on data does not exist. Perhaps the analog version, the human brain, can help us understand this idea a bit better. A human brain in isolation right, can only do so many things. It's when the brain can learn on data that the magic happens. We call this education, or learning, more generally. The brain itself is necessary, but it's the access to data in the form of knowledge, in the form of education, that makes us the most intelligent individuals to ever walk the face of the earth. Of such an intelligence that we can even create artificial intelligence. And to take this analogy one step further, if you learn on small or false or just generally crappy data, your brain will consistently make the wrong predictions. I was thinking about inserting a comment on American politics, but I'm not going to do this. <laughs> Coincidentally, this is why science has been such a boon for mankind. The scientific method helps us ensure that our brains get trained on high quality data. So the central idea I'd like to bring forward here is that the enormous power of AI is based on data. If we want everyone to have access to this power, we need widespread access to data. Or put slightly differently, and in less than 140 characters, broad open data access is an absolute necessity for human liberty in the machine age. So if we accept this, then the question immediately arises, how do we get there? The fact that AI power is derived from data also means that from an economic perspective, privileged data access is, is incredibly valuable. Market players with privileged data access have absolutely no interest uh, in losing this privilege. This is understandable. In the information economy, being able to extract information from data that can be used commercially is a matter of life and death, economically speaking. Forcing these players to give up their privileged access to data, which they generally collected themselves, would likely have severely negative consequences, economic, negative economic consequences. It would also be highly unethical, for example. I'd be very upset if we forced Google to open their data centers where anyone could have access to my data. So there has to be another way. And I would like to offer a suggestion for another way. The access to personal data should be controlled by those who generate the data, not by those who collect it. That's really, I think, key. So I'm just going to say it again. Access to personal data should be controlled by those who generate the data, not by those who collect it. The data generator is the person whose data is collected. And in order for the data generator to be able to control access to this data, the collector needs to provide the person a copy of the personal data. So let's make an example. Let's say you use a provider's map on your smartphone to drive from A to B. As you're driving, GPS data of your trip is collected by the app maker. The app maker makes use of this kind of data to give you real-time traffic information, for example. Great service. But you'll never be able to access this data easily. You should be able to access this data either in real time or with some delay and do whatever you please to do with it. From training your own AI 
to sharing or even selling it to third parties. Okay, another example. Let's say you track your fitness with some device. You always shop for food at the same grocery store. And perhaps you're also taking part in a cohort study where your genome was sequenced with your permission. So the fitness device maker may reuse your data to make a more compelling product somehow. The grocery store may direct ads at you for new products that fit your food profile. The cohort study will use your DNA data for research. All good. But is it easy for you to recombine these three data sources? Not at the moment. You should be able to access all three data sources, your fitness data, your nutrition data, and your DNA, without having to ask anyone for permission, for whatever reason. If you're now asking why would anyone want that data, I think you're asking the exact wrong question. It's not anyone's business why you would want that data. The point is that you should be able to get it with zero effort in machine-readable format and then you should be allowed to do with it whatever you want to do. It's your data. In some situations, in fact, we're already quite close to this scenario. For example, when you open a bank account, of course you will be able to access every last detail of any transaction at any point in time offline, online, whenever and wherever you want to, without having to ask anyone. Any banking service without this possibility would be unthinkable. So why isn't it like this with any data, with any service? If I can have my financial data like that, then why can I not have the same access to my health data, my location data, my shopping data, and so on? So once you own your data, and once it's easily accessible for you and for us, then it will be possible for us to let others access the data, provided we allow it. We can, for example, give the data to third parties, such as trusted research groups, not-for-profit organizations, even trusted parts of the government, even trusted corporations, whatever we choose to do with it. At the moment, this sounds perhaps a bit futuristic, but imagine, for example, a trusted health data organization, perhaps a cooperative, where hundreds or thousands or even millions of people share their health data. This would be an enormous data pool that could be studied by public health officials to make better health recommendations. It could be investigated by pharmaceutical companies to design new drugs. And to bring this back to the original thought about AI, anyone could use this data to improve the future artificial intelligence agents that will increasingly make health decisions on your behalf. So, today we'll hear many excellent arguments, I'm sure, that make the case for open data, highlighting social, political, economical, and scientific aspects, and many other aspects. My argument is that human liberty cannot exist in the machine age that is run by algorithms unless people have broad access to data to improve their own intelligent agents. And from this perspective, it makes in fact no sense to be concerned about smart machines or smart algorithms. The major concern should be about closed data. We won't be able to leverage the phenomenal power of smart learning machines for the public good and for us, and for distributed AI, for distributed power really, if all the data is locked away, accessible only to select few. So we need data of the people, by the people, and for the people. Thank you. So that was excellent, really giving us like the broader context of the stuff we just do like every day without like thinking that far ahead. But I, I also know that you're involved in very concrete projects trying to like sort of implement that vision, right? So can you perhaps tell us a bit about the projects you guys do at, at EPFL and other contexts that work towards the, that vision of 
data of the people by for the people? Um, yeah, sure. Um, well, let's see if I mention the projects that you had in mind. We, so one of the projects, for example, we're working on and trying to leverage AI is for farming and, and for uh, crops and battling crop diseases. So now, um, <clears throat> for example, uh, machine learning on images, so image recognition, image classification is now so advanced that it's um, repeatedly in many domains achieved human accuracy or in fact uh, in some domains exceeded human accuracy. And the amazing thing is that when you train an algorithm on lots and lots of data so that it can later accurately classify data it has not seen, um, that process itself takes a long time but um, once it's trained it's, it takes you know a few milliseconds on a CPU without any internet connection. And so you can now put this stuff on mobile phones, even in places where mobile phones are not yet very good and um, where there's no internet connection. And so we train, for example, uh, machine learning algorithms to recognize uh, diseases based on just an images, uh, based on just an image you can take with your phone. So that's something we do, and it's a project called plantvillage.org. Uh, we're also, so obviously in the, in the interest of this, we're collecting disease data from people, I mean, this, this is plant disease data, and we put it openly accessible uh, on the web. And then we go one step further and we created this platform called crowdai.org, where we run challenges, open source, you know, open algorithm development challenges, and at the moment, uh, the plant disease challenge is one that we're running, we're currently running one on uh, recognizing images taken by NASA and ESA. The next one will be a genetic prediction challenge, so that's going to be interesting. And then we're, we're doing all kinds of things, but the, but the point is that this data um, always is in the open and the algorithms, all the algorithms that are developed are in the open. So I, I encourage anyone to check it out. Maybe. Okay. Uh, but Wait a second, so when you say data by the people, so, really that's, so that's data about me, right? Yep. And so when you say data is, power, data is power, I have a lot of data, I generate data with yep. every breath I take, yep. why don't I have the power? <laughs> Maybe you could, I mean. Well, I mean, so you, you, I mean, you have the power uh, over your data, but much of the data that is collected on you is not directly available to you. Um, and, and then also, I mean, even if you had access to all the data about you, I mean, that would be great, that would be a first great step, but you cannot train a machine learning algorithm on just one data point that's you. So what you need is you need thousands and thousands of data points. And then you can train AI that really becomes very smart. And so for example, I mean, to give you one practical example, um, there's this service, right, that perhaps many of you know, 23andMe, which is a direct-to-consumer uh, personal genetic service where for, I don't know how many bucks now, 99 or 199 or whatever, you, you spit in a tube and you send the tube to, to the U.S. and this gets sampled and in, in, in very nice format you get your data, ancestry and some health data, although that's now been, I think, shut down, but that's going to restart. But you can actually download the data. You can download your DNA that in text file. And so you can then donate the data to others. So for example, there's this thing called OpenSNP um, where people can donate their DNA into the public domain. And so far about two and, two and a half thousand people have done this. And so now we can do you know, research with that data. I mean, two and a half thousand is still not a lot, but it's the largest um, open access genetic data um, database. In fact, if you think about this, if only one in four people of 23andMe would push their data back into a repository, it doesn't necessarily have to be totally open, I realize that's not everyone's game, but you know, a nice database that, that where ethically approved research projects could have access to, that would be now more than 300,000 genomes. The largest study that has ever been done <laughs> Today, as far as I'm aware, maybe I'm one year behind, it has been something like 270,000 genomes. So we could do the largest, um, everyone would have access to the largest genetic database like this. 
it would already be possible today. Marcel, many thanks indeed. All the best for these projects, and we should have more biologists talking about data policies. Many thanks indeed. Master Salatin.